जननम सुखधम मरणम करुणम मिलनम मधुरम स्मरणम शादिह सकल करुण समयाद्यपत अखिल Good morning, everyone. Uh, today uh, we're supposed to look at life sense. When we say life sense, uh, I'm particularly speaking to all the iPhone lovers. <laughs> You're on Samsung. <laughs> There is a gadget far more interesting than your phone. That's called the human mechanism. This is the gadget. Every other gadget is a small drop of… Th of this. So, uh, when we say human being, I think for a long time, people have been looking at this human being with too much emotion and too much confusion. But the yogic sciences have always looked at the human being as the ultimate mechanism on this planet. When we say mechanism, we're talking about something that can work systematically, something that can do things, something that can consistently produce something wonderful. If it is not a mechanism, that means it's one chaotic nonsense <laughs> So. There are both type of human beings. Some are just one chaotic nonsense, some have become wonderful mechanism. Not because somebody has come with a great mechanism and somebody has not. All of us fundamentally have come with the same thing. Maybe on the level of our physical form and maybe on intellectual levels, there may be some differences. But essentially, all of us carry the same human mechanism. But why is it that one seems to be in a phenomenal state and another seems to be a total mess. There are many ways to look at it. One simple thing is we can look at it this way, every human experience that human beings have. Here, the little children, you have to do something to make them unhappy right now. You have to do something to make them unhappy. But there are a whole lot of adults, you have to do something to make them happy. <laughs> They've reversed the equation completely. At the age of five, if you were this joyful, by the time you are thirty, you should have been ecstatic, isn't it? <laughs> if things happen in the right order. <laughs> but for some reason, it's gotten reversed to most people. As I said, Every human experience has a chemical basis to it. We can call it peace, we can call it joy, we can call it love, we can call it blissfulness, we can call it ecstasy, we can call it agony, anxiety, misery, stress, tension, whatever we want to call it. Every human experience has a chemical basis to it. Or in other words, what you call as myself right now is a chemical soup. The question is only, is it a great soup or a lousy soup? If I give all of you the same soup-making ingredients, do you believe that all of you will come up with the same kind of soup? No. Five hundred varieties of soups will happen, that's all that's happened. All of us have come here fundamentally with the same ingredients, just see in how many ways we have become. The reason is, 
we have been given such a complex mechanism and do you agree with… do you agree with me all the uh, gadget lovers, I'm asking you? This is the most sophisticated machine on the planet, do you agree with me? So I'm asking you, someone gave you such a complex and sophisticated machine, have you read the user's manual? <laughs> no? <laughs> so without the user's manual, if you operate something, how would you do it? By accident, something will happen, once in a way it works. Once in a way something is working. And to make this human being happy <laughs> in pursuit of human well-being, we've ripped the planet apart, all right? I want you to understand there is no ecological disaster on the planet. Ecological disaster is just a consequence of human beings not knowing how to be joyful by their own nature, because we are seeking it everywhere else except here. But all human experience happens from within. What happens here, if you try to cause it from outside, then you have to burn the planet definitely and that's what we're doing. So ecological disasters have not happened because of something else, only in pursuit of human well-being, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. So in pursuit of human well-being, last hundred, hundred and fifty years, we've done too many things using the power of science and the prowess of technology, we've done too many things. So many things that if you happen to be here two hundred years ago and you're here again today, you wouldn't recognize the place for anything. Everything has been changed. Because of this change, much comfort and convenience has come. When it comes to comfort and convenience, we are definitely the most comfortable generation ever. Do you agree with me? I'm asking even those who are standing <laughs> We are definitely the most comfortable generation ever, isn't it? But we cannot claim we are the most joyful, we cannot claim we are the most loving, we cannot even claim we are the most peaceful. To be peaceful and happy, today I'm sure <laughs> many people are uh, propagating this and even the so-called spiritual leaders are going about saying, peace is the ultimate goal of life. Such people will only rest in peace <laughs> Because, tell me, today, if you want to enjoy your lunch today, if you're not ecstatic, at least you must be peaceful, isn't it? Hello? If you are not in some state of ecstasy, at least you must be peaceful to enjoy the food that you eat, isn't it? So I'm asking you, to be peaceful, to be happy, is it the ultimate goal of your life or is it a fundamental requirement of your life? It is a most fundamental requirement. If you are not even peaceful, I don't know how many have died under your care <laughs> Because uh, <laughs> when you're not even peaceful and happy, you tend to do things which are neither good for you nor for anybody, isn't it? <laughs> this is the nature of the human being. When we are not peaceful and happy, don't we tend to do things which were not good for us and not good for anybody? Now, <clears throat> this peace has been taken to heaven. People say, if you say peace, people say divine peace. If you say joy, you'll, they'll say divine joy. If you say love, they'll say divine love. These are all human things. Human beings are capable of being peaceful, joyful, loving, but all these things have been exported to heaven <laughs> by those who are crippled. <laughs> crippled lives have exported these things to heaven. If you say peace, they say it happens only there. <laughs> if you say joy, it happens only there. If you say love, it happens only there. Even your dog is capable of being loving, isn't it so? Yes. You don't have to reach as far as God to know love, a dog will do it, yes? Consistently, yes or no? If you get yourself a dog, twelve years guaranteed love affair or no? Yes? 
I, I won't say the same thing about everybody else but <laughs> there is no guarantee about others, but a dog is a guaranteed love affair, isn't it? Now, these things have been raised like this. You know, I… I was to speak at uh, Tel Aviv. I was flying out of Atlanta. I was to land there in the morning and speak at 6.30 in the evening, but then I land up there at 6 o'clock in the evening because of some flight delays. And I'm quickly changing in the airport to rush to the venue because in these thirty-four years I have not been late to a single appointment in my life, so I don't want to break this. So I'm quickly changing and rushing and I'm famished because uh, I'm traveling by an American airline, there's nothing edible to… on the plane, you know? <laughs> there's nothing edible on the plane. So I'm really famished and when I go to the venue, to my joy I find the venue is a very fine restaurant, life can't get better. When you're so hungry, they've taken you to a restaurant straight. So, people are coming in and greeting me, one man comes up and says, Shalom. I ask him, what does it mean? He says, this is the highest way of greeting. I said, well, that's your opinion, what does it mean? He said, no, no, this is really the highest way of greeting. I said, all right, but what does the word mean? He said, it means peace. I said, why would peace be the highest way of greeting unless you're born in Middle East? <laughs> In South India, somebody comes up to me in the morning and says, peace, I'll say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so I'm saying anything that you are deprived of will slowly rise to heaven. Everything that human beings are talking about, everything that human beings have attributed to their gods, everything that human beings have exported to heaven, these are all human qualities, yes? Those who made themselves incapable, they're talking it'll happen somewhere else. But today human intellect is talking like never before. Never before this many human beings could think for themselves, yes? Never before in the history of humanity, because otherwise a priest, a pandit, a scripture, something else thought for you. Now human beings are beginning to think for themselves. Whether they're thinking straight or not is another issue, but <laughs> at least they're thinking something. <laughs> it's a good beginning, you know, something they're thinking. Once they start thinking, the problem with thought is, it has to be logically correct, otherwise it doesn't go by. Even the most idiotic argument if you witness, people are talking the way they're talking because they believe it's logically correct. Yes or no? Nobody thinks he's logically wrong and continues to argue, he won't do that. He somehow finds a way to make it logically correct. So once this happens, that human intellect begins to fire like this, even if God comes and stands here and speaks, unless he makes sense, people will reject him. Yes or no? Maybe you don't have the courage to say yes, your children, they are going to reject it. Unless it makes sense to them, they are going to reject it. Yes or no? So once they reject it, it may so happen, heavens will crumble, heavens will fall down. You know what is in heaven? You don't know. Let me tell you so that you can make your choices. <laughs> Hindu heaven, food is great. Because Nala himself cooks for you there. <laughs> Nala himself cooks, he's the best chef in the universe. So food is very good, if you're a foodie, you must go to Hindu heaven. In another heaven, in the clouds, white-gowned ladies are floating. If you like that kind of ambience, you can go there. In another heaven, you'll have virgin problems. If you want to encounter that, you can go there. <laughs> Only problem is, what is the qualification for you to get there? This happened in a Sunday school in Alabama. 
Anybody from Alabama? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I would have chosen other state if you had told me you're here. <laughs> uh, the Sunday school teacher in his enthusiasm asked the tiny tots, what do you have to do to go to heaven? Little Mary stood up and said, if I scrub the church floor every Sunday morning, I will go to heaven. Absolutely! Another little girl stood up and said, if I share fifty percent of my pocket money with my less privileged friend, I will go to heaven. Absolutely! Another boy said, if those who are in need of help, if I reach out and help them, I will go to heaven. Correct! Little Tommy in the back bench stood up and said, you gotta die first. So you got to die first, that is the basic qualification, all right <laughs> So when you die, depending on your culture, we'll either bury you or burn you or feed you to the birds. <laughs> One of the things we will do to you, yes? yes. <clears throat> it is the <coughs> or in other words, anyway your body, we put it back into this earth because this body is something that you borrowed from this planet, isn't it so? You're on loan. If you were planning to take it to heaven, you're a willful defaulter, you know <laughs> Yes? <laughs> it's good to pay this back, isn't it? What we have taken, we can use it well. When it's time, we must pay back the loan or no? Put it back into the earth. Whether you like it or not, they will <laughs> So once you left your body here, what will you do with good food and virgins and all this stuff? These are all problems that people have when they have a body, isn't it? Once you put the body here, what will you do with all these things? So I'm saying, once intellect fires big time, we have kept it down because if you ask questions, we would have you dead for a long time. Please understand <laughs> With this we had kept it down, but we can't keep it down anymore. Now people will ask all kinds of things. When they ask two, three questions, heavens will crumble. Heavens may crumble, but human longing to experience something more will not go. The human longing to experience something will always be there. If you take away the hope that somewhere else it's going to happen to you, people will start seeking solutions here. When they start seeking solutions here, if you don't show them a way, if you don't show them a way which is logically correct and scientifically ascertainable way where you can take charge of your inner experience and cause the kind of experience that you want to be in, if you don't teach them the ways, if you don't give them the technologies for inner well-being, then I would say in another sixty to eighty years' time, ninety percent of the humanity will seek chemical solutions. They will be either on drink or drug. Tell me, most of you, whatever your age right now, when you were twenty years of age, how many people were drinking and drugging on this planet? Today, how many people are doing? Has it gone up by thousand percent at least? Yes. Ten times over or more? Yes. It has. This is because people are seeking solutions here, because slowly all these people are losing faith that somewhere else it'll be better. They're trying to make it better right here. If you don't show them the right way, they will somehow try to do it. Now I'm not talk looking at this as a moral issue. Ninety percent of the people being on drink and drug is not a moral issue for me. One responsibility we have as a generation of people is that when we leave, we have left a generation which is at least one step better than us. This is a fundamental responsibility we have as a generation. But when we leave, if we are all on ninety percent of us or on drink and drug, when we leave, we will leave a worse generation than us because we will become incapable of even producing a better generation. And this will be a complete failure of who we are, everything that we worked for, the development of civilizations, all this will go waste if ninety percent of the population goes on this. 
In New York City, what do you think is the percentage? Huh? I'll leave it to you. People from New York tell me. What do you think is the percentage who are seeking some kind of chemical solution for their experience to make themselves peaceful, they have to drink something or pop something? What do you think is the percentage? <laughs> I wouldn't be that cruel, there are lots of yoga freaks <laughs> But it's a big percentage, not a percentage to ignore anymore, isn't it? It's like, you know, those of you who come from India anyway, you know, all of you are largely. Uh, you know, when you were growing up as children, you, there were few drunkards in the town. Yes? yes? One, maybe two percent, those… they are drunkards, you know, they're not normal people. But they are the normal ones now. <laughs> there are a few who don't drink, who are freakish. <laughs> there are two freaks… there are two percent freaks who don't drink anymore. So, this is not a moral thing, this is just that you have become incapable of dealing with yourself. That is a fundamental thing. See, what amazes me is people live here fifty, sixty, seventy years. They are sixty, seventy years of age, still they do not know how to deal with their own thought and their own emotion. This is… this you may think is normal, is not normal, I'm telling you. If you do not… see, these are the basic faculties that you have. A human being can think about anything he or she wants, can emote in many strong ways. If these thoughts and emotions don't work for you, they're working against you, that means you've not figured the fundamentals of being human, isn't it? Yes. You would have been peaceful if you were born as an earthworm or something. The problem… the problem is right now, Human beings are not suffering something that they don't have. Their suffering is because of their own intelligence. If I take away half your brain, most of you would be peaceful <laughs> Yes? <laughs> it's being done in the… you know, in some institutions it's being done, lobotomy is being conducted, right? When it's… when somebody cannot control themselves at all, pull off a part of the brain, they're quite peaceful. I think it's… Uh, people are even suggesting it's time we do it when the children are born, if you take off certain things, criminal attitudes will go, this will go, that will go. People are suggesting such things, responsible medical institutions are suggesting such things. If you cripple everybody, there may be no crime in New York City. If you cut off everybody's legs or you take off everybody's head, there'll be no crime at all <laughs> But it will also take off the possibility. It may take off some small problem, but it will take off the possibility of being human, isn't it? To be a full-fledged human being is important. If you want to be a full-fledged human being, there are two fundamental things. One thing is a human being has a vivid sense of memory. Another thing is a human being also has a vivid sense of imagination. Whatever suffering you go through, you may call it stress, anxiety, tension, misery, grief, whatever you want to call it, essentially it is just this. You have still not figured how to handle your memory, how to handle your imagination. That's all you're suffering. What happened ten years ago, you can still suffer, isn't it so? What may happen day after tomorrow, you already suffer. That means you are capable of suffering the non-existential. You are capable of suffering something that does not exist. I'm sure there are psychiatrists in the group, are they? Okay. This… <laughs> even by medical definition, if somebody is suffering that does not exist, do they qualify? Do they qualify or no? They do qualify as patients, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying if you start suffering something that does not exist, that means you even medically you qualify as a case. <laughs> case number whatever <laughs> Now, this is not a joke because without we are leaving human beings, with education systems, which will teach you everything about the world, not a thing about yourself. Trying to control this with fear, 
trying to control this with possibilities of punishment somewhere else. It's not worked. Anyway, people are doing what the hell they're doing, aren't they? Yes. It is time that we bring sense to the world. We are always thinking in terms of good and bad. This has happened because of certain types of religious beliefs, certain types of things where everything is controlled by fear and guilt and whatever. First thing is you divided the world into God and devil, good and evil, this and that. No, I'll ask you a simple question. Is there anybody here who is twenty-four hours good or twenty-four hours bad? Hello? You… Yes or no? You oscillate right a little bit, here and there. One moment you're wonderful, another moment you're nasty, another moment you're beautiful, another moment you're ugly. Is this not happening? So, if we have to divide you between good and evil, probably we have to cut off a part of you. That is what they're saying. If we take off certain parts of your brain, all evil will go and you will become pure and useless <laughs> The biggest problem is we've been trying to produce good people. The world never tried to produce sensible and joyful people. We have always been striving to produce good people and it's good people who are constantly at each other. It is always a good Hindu fighting a good Muslim, a good Indian fighting a good Pakistani, more good, more fighting <laughs> and a good American fighting good just about anybody. Because the more good you think you are, more confrontational you have become. Please see this. The more good you think you are, you naturally become more confrontational with just about anybody around you. If you think you are very good, the… how this has come to you in your mind is you look at these people, she's not okay, she's not okay, she's not okay, he's not okay, he's not okay. Compared to all these people, I'm good, I'm very good means nobody is good. <laughs> Nobody is okay. Nobody is okay is not a question of goodness, it's a question of madness. <laughs> the madness has settled in. <clears throat> this has to go means human consciousness has to rise. You have to look at this tremendous possibility that we have come with. And is it true? Can you see me at least? Hello, everybody? Yes. Even if you're not listening, can you see me? <laughs> Use one hand, point out where am I, please. Try him. Uh, no, you know I'm a mystic from South India, you got it all wrong <laughs> Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the whole story. So where do you see me right now? Within yourself? Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself? Where have you seen the whole world? Within yourself. Have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? Have you? Right now someone sitting next to you, if they touch your hand, you think you're experiencing their hand. No, you're only experiencing the sensations in your hand, isn't it? Even without the help of the other person, you can with little imagination cause the sensations you want, isn't it? So your entire experience of life, light and darkness is happening within you. Agony and ecstasy happens within you, joy and misery happens within you, peace and turmoil happens within you. If every human experience is generated from within, at least at least what happens within you must happen your way, isn't it? World will not happen your way and I'm glad it's not happening your way because if the entire world happened your way, where do I go? <laughs> I'm glad it's not happening your way, little bit my way, little bit your way, little bit somebody else's way, it's all right. But the important thing is this one is not happening your way. This is a big problem, isn't it? If this one person, yourself, if this one person happened your way, would you 
keep this person blissful or miserable. You must make a choice, I'm going to bless you right now <laughs> What is your choice? For yourself, what is your choice? Highest level of pleasantness, isn't it? What you want for your neighbor may be debatable <laughs> but what you want for yourself is very, very clear, isn't it so? But why such a simple thing is not happening? Simply because, you know… you know Charles Darwin? Some hundred… hundred and fifty years ago, 2012 was uh, two hundredth birth anniversary of Darwin. Some hundred and fifty years ago, he propounded a theory and he said, what was a deer could have become a giraffe? so many million years. What was a pig could have become an elephant, so many more million years? What was a monkey became a human, but it happened rather quickly <laughs> Yes <laughs> So quickly that anthropologists think there is a missing link <laughs> They're still looking out, I'm saying <laughs> Did anybody meet? Did you meet a missing link, I'm asking? No <laughs> Now, <clears throat> they're saying the DNA difference between you and a chimpanzee is only 1.23 percent. 1.23 percent is not much of a difference, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> not much of a percentage, <laughs> not a percentage to boast about, isn't it? Thing is just this, physiologically, you are only 1.23 percent away from a chimpanzee. But in terms of your intellect and awareness, we are worlds apart from a chimpanzee. So this is the problem. You have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough base. Now, this same intelligence, the sharper it is, the more it pokes you. So people are thinking, dulling it either with wine or divine is the solution <laughs> Somehow dull it for some time and you feel peaceful. Dulling it not the solution, sharpening it to a point where it will work for you is the solution, isn't it? If you dull it, you're somehow crippling yourself, isn't it? In some way you dull the system. Maybe you think it's temporary, but if you dull the system, in some way you're crippling yourself. If crippling yourself is a solution, death is a better solution, <laughs> isn't it? Yes or no? If taking a little bit of the brain is a solution, blowing your brains out is definitely a better solution, more efficient <laughs> This happened. I, <laughs> I was teaching a program in India and uh, somebody stands up and she introduces herself. She says, I have come from Singapore, in the last two years I committed suicide five times. I said, stop. At this level of inefficiency, you are not getting anywhere <laughs> If you in some way think, by dulling the system, you will be better off, which the world is practicing large scale. Now you're saying in New York City it's ninety percent, I don't think so. Uh, but it's getting there, rapidly getting there in that direction. Drink will lose its hmm, draw after some time. More efficient things will come slowly. All things will get legalized when they can't control it anymore, please know this <laughs> Everything will get legalized, the moment they can't control it, they'll feel it's better to tax it and run the nation rather than <laughs> investing too much on policing these things. So when these things happen, it is a question of crippling the human being in some way. Yes, it gives pleasure. If you take off the brain, maybe you can just float around in total, utter peace. But all possibilities are also gone, isn't it? So this is happening to us because we have not 
understood the fundamentals of how to exercise our own intelligence. We have learned how to make a living, we have learned how to do things, we have learned how to go to the moon or even beyond. But we have still not figured how to manage our own system, isn't it? Even if you have a spacecraft, this is more complex than that? Yes or no? Yes. This is far more complex than that. And this does not mean, when I say this, I'm not just… I mean, all of you doctors, maybe you're thinking of exploring me pathologically. <laughs> We're not talking about just lungs, liver, kidney, heart, spleen, whatever. All this came from within. See, you eat a piece of bread in the morning. You know, two hours, this bread becomes human body. You know as doctors how complex each one each part of the body is, that you know it is so complex, that is why today if we have to go to a medical checkup, we have to go to fifty different doctors because for fifty different parts of the body. <laughs> Slowly as you look at it closer and closer, you are realizing it's too complex for one person to grasp the entire thing, isn't it? Yes or no? Just thirty-two teeth, people are taking nine years to understand what's happening in the mouth and they still don't know? Yes or no? Yes? yes? Just to teeth, only thirty-two, nine years of study and still we know we don't know all of it. We know… we know pretty well but not all of it, isn't it? So you are realizing it's so complex, but this complex mechanism, with what are you manufacturing? You eat a piece of bread, you eat a banana, you eat an apple, you eat whatever you want. Within few hours, it becomes this. So there is an intelligence here. There is an intelligence here which can make a banana into a human being, yes or no? Yes. Suppose I took a banana in my hand and transformed this into a human being, who do you think I am? Magician. Who is this, huh? <laughs> Where did you see a magician who made a banana into a human being? <laughs> What is this? <laughs> Only creator could do this, isn't it? But every one of you are doing this every day? <laughs> Only thing is, you are doing it unconsciously. If only a drop of this intelligence entered your life in a conscious form, you would live magically, not miserably. Life wouldn't be a struggle, it would be an ecstatic breeze. <laughs> this happened in… <clears throat> 1924, there was a bishop in Istanbul who is from the Gr Orthodox Greek community. You know the Orthodox Greek community have their own pope in Istanbul. They believe they are the only real Christians, the rest are no good <laughs> So they have their own pope and they have their own stuff going. Being on the silk route, Exotic stories from India keep wafting across the Bosphorus too often, so he heard so many magical stories. And he always wanted to go to India, but being a man of cloth, he couldn't decide where he goes. So when he was over sixty years of age, when he semi-retired, he got the opportunity to come to southern India. So his longing was to meet a yogi, he wants to meet a mystic, a genuine one, not the tourists who came to Istanbul and claimed. He wants to meet a real one. So somebody told him, you go up this mountain and they gave him some landmarks, there in front of a cave there will be a yogi sitting, that's a man you're looking for. So he found his way up, he was not built for mountains. So he huffed and puffed and went up. Mountain is one place where you can't deceive yourself of your age <laughs> So went there, then he saw this yogi was sitting here, eyes closed, blissed out. So he went and they had told him, if you see an Indian yogi, you must prostrate. So he went down, he was not built for that either. With great difficulty he went down and huffing and puffing, you sat up again. Hearing all this commotion, the yogi opened his eyes and smiled. Immediately the bishop asked, Can I ask you a question? 
The yogi laughed and said, by all means, why not? So the bishop asked, what is life? This is after sixty, you know. <laughs> you should have asked this question when you were eight. <laughs> if you missed it out at least by sixteen, what? What is life? You must ask now, isn't it? But what to do? Better late than never. So he asked, what is life? When he asked this question, the yogi went into raptures and then he said, life, life is like the fragrance of jasmine upon the gentle spring breeze. The bishop <laughs> Fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze? No, our teacher told us, life is like a thorn. Once it gets into you, if you stand it hurts, if you sit it hurts, it lie down it hurts <laughs> You are saying it is like fragrance of a jasmine upon gentle spring breeze? What is this? he asked. The yogi laughed and said, well, that's his life. experience of your life is entirely generated from within. Is that so? Yes. What is being generated from within must be happening your way. Must happen your way, isn't it? But right now, just about anybody can make you happy, make you unhappy, make you miserable, make you frustrated, make you angry, make you so many things. This means you are in a very deep state of slavery. Somebody decides what should happen within you, not even around you. What should happen within you, somebody decides. This is a terrible state to be in, isn't it? Because we have not taken charge of this fundamental thing. Something so tremendous has been given to us, but we are busy. We read one piece here, one piece there, we read a uh, uh, one titbit from this scripture, another titbit from that scripture and self-help book, this book, that book, all titbits. But it's not working here and there in small way. On a certain day, a bull, you know a bull? A bull was grazing, chomp, 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 slowly green grass led him into deep into the jungle, he went deep inside. There, there was a lion who was past his prime and he was having difficulty hunting in the jungle because the animals are fast and he is getting slow. Then he saw, after many weeks of grazing, this bull had become nice and fat. He saw this nice fat bull, his mouth watered, he stalked him, found the right moment, pounced upon him, killed him and he ate him up. Stomach became full. With great satisfaction, he roared. There were a few hunters passing by. They heard this roar, they tracked the lion down and shot him dead. <laughs> the moral of the story is, when you're so full of bull, you should not open your mouth. <laughs> So, the fundamental thing is, at least, at least we must come to this. What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. Is this okay? Yes. Can we come to this much sincerity? What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. Is it okay? Yes. No, no, right now the thing is, whatever I don't know, I believe. Whatever I do not know, I believe. Once you believe, you get enormous confidence without clarity. Confidence without clarity is the biggest disaster on this planet. Human beings who don't have clarity must at least have humility and hesitation in them. No clarity, but they have confidence. Oh, because see, the nature of human intelligence is like this. 
If you do something stupid right now, tonight your intelligence will bother you, why did I do this? This is the nature of human intelligence. But if your stupidity is scripture endorsed or God endorsed, then you can do the same idiotic things with utter confidence <laughs> You don't have to turn back and look. It doesn't matter what is the result of your actions, how horrendous it is, but you can go on doing it because God has endorsed your stupidity. Can we come to this much, at least all of you doctors, you must come to this, what I know, I know, what I do not know, I do not know. Is it okay? Yes. Because I do not know is a tremendous possibility. When you see truly, when you genuinely see I do not know, the longing to know and seeking to know and the possibility of knowing becomes real in your life. Otherwise, everything I do not know, I believe. You can believe anything. If we work hard enough on you, we can make you believe just about anything, yes or no? From your childhood, if we work on you, we can make you believe anything. Right from your childhood, if I go on telling you, my little finger is God, if I raise this little finger, divine emotions will genuinely overflow within you, yes or no? Yes. If you feel this is too bare, I can dress it up <laughs> We can do some things. This happened. I was speaking to a group of people in Nashville, in Tennessee. Tennessee people? Hey! <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and I was just telling them a joke. In the joke, I referred to God as him. Immediately these few ladies stood up and said, Do you believe God is a man? I said, Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I was only telling you a joke. <laughs> they said, It doesn't matter. You said him. Do you believe God is a man? Now this is a big issue in some of the southern churches in America, is God a man or woman? They're trying to settle in this election of course, but <laughs> Is God a man or a woman is going to become a serious issue in America in the coming years once the president is on <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But in India, we have no such problems. We have a man god, we have a woman god, we have a elephant god, we have a cow god, we have a snake god, we have a crawling one, we have a creeping one, we have a flying one, every kind. Because we are a very wise culture, we foresaw all the future problems that may occur. Who knows who will claim tomorrow what? <laughs> I was… I was… just two weeks ago, I was in Uganda. You know, there was… in Uganda, there was this… Some of you come from there? Oh, yeah. I was in Uganda two weeks ago and uh, Idi Amin declared, God is black <laughs> I agree with him because if a white man can have a white God, why can't a black man have a black God? What's the problem? But these people don't know. Because they've never seen God, you know. They saw only the messengers, sons and stuff. In India, we know God is brown <laughs> Yes? Because God himself landed in India nine times. You know this? Nine avatars, nine times God himself landed in India, himself. Not his son, not his messenger, himself <laughs> Indians <laughs> Indians are always very proud of this. God came himself to India, to other places he sent messengers and <laughs> So, <laughs> I… wait, wait, wait. So I keep… I keep reminding them that is because God wouldn't trust anybody with Indians <laughs> He wanted to… he wanted to do the job hands-on So he himself came nine times and failed. Nine or ten times debatable, but failure is not debatable, isn't it? So, we can believe what we want. 
our beliefs may have something to do with our cultural milieu, we can wear our culture. We can… Cu culture is the color of our life. We can wear our culture, we can be proud of it, we can enjoy it, but culture is not a tool for seeking truth. Culture is not an efficient tool because what you do today, whatever nonsense you do today is tomorrow's culture, yes or no? Whatever nonsense they did yesterday is today's culture. Culture is never a conscious process, to some extent maybe. Rest is all hodgepodge of all kinds of things that many people did, isn't it so? Or do you believe that all of you consciously creating tomorrow's culture? Are you? Not at all. Whatever nonsense you do, your children will pick it up and they'll do it little differently, isn't it? <laughs> so, culture is not a conscious tool. Culture is… doesn't have sharp edges. It is just like that, simply evolving like an amoeba <laughs> in various forms, in various… everybody in this room full of people, each person will have their own understanding of what is Indian culture right now, yes or no? And you're free to have that because it is you who are making the culture, you are the producers of culture. This is not an instrument of truth. But if you do not know the truth about your own nature, how can you conduct this well? Only by accident. When you conduct something so sophisticated by accident, anxiety is natural, isn't it? Everybody is a client, you can put that up <laughs> in your practice. <laughs> Psychiatrist, everybody is a client. I was just joking, we started many crema crematoriums because the conditions were very bad in southern India. Isha started many crematoriums. People asked Sadhguru, what should the… what should be the byline? <laughs> so we called it Kayantastanam, that means where the body ends. Byline, I said, put it, everybody is a customer <laughs> Don't do any market development, just wait. Everybody will come one day. You don't have to do any marketing, anyway they will come, isn't it? So madness is also going to become like this, that almost everybody is a client. If you get angry, you say, I'm mad at you, isn't it? You're admitting it. <laughs> but without doctor's help, you're able to come back to reasonable states, but you're flying off. One day when you cross the line, if you cannot come back, then you're clinically ill. Yes? But otherwise also you're ill. If you do not know how to manage your own thought, if you do not know how to manage your emotion, if your intelligence does not function for you, it functions against you, would you term this kind of madness? Maybe there are not enough couches for all of you, so we left you loose on the street <laughs> But it's happening, isn't it? So. Especially all of you being in medical profession, I would plead with you, you must invest some time upon yourself. If you believe… if you believe that the work that you're doing is important, the most important thing is you work upon yourself. Because nobody can produce anything beyond themselves. You only… your work is only an expression of what you are. Nothing more than you can ever happen. Unless you enhance this, what you do can never be enhanced. Enhancing this means there are many ways to look at it. I'll put it very simply, considering that I have to catch a plane <laughs> See, when we say intelligence, today because of English language and the so-called modern education, the kind of education that most of us have gone through is just education which was designed to produce obedient people, not intelligent people. It was not designed to cultivate geniuses. It was designed to curb your genius and make you into an obedient person so that you can take orders from Her Majesty's service. Yes, essentially it was created for that purpose. Maybe you're useful in some job but it will not allow you as a human being to really blossom to create something. It is created for mass production. 
of something, whatever that is. There are some interests, goals set up by other people, how to produce nuts and bolts for that large machine that we have created is how the education is structured. This is not cultured for individual enhancement, this is not cultured for… see, if you're looking at… anyway, the children's schools are called nurseries, isn't it? Isn't it? A nursery means what? You must provide conducive soil for this plant to grow its fullest possibility. This is the aspiration for every life, whether it's an earthworm or a grasshopper or a tree or a bird or an animal, all of them are aspiring to become full-fledged life, isn't it? But the problem is, we know what is a full-fledged grasshopper, we know what is a full-fledged earthworm, we know what is a full-fledged bird, we don't know what is a full-fledged human being. Because for the human being, for every other creature, there are two lines which nature has drawn. Within that, they live and die. For the human being, there is only bottom line, there is no top line. Because there is no top line, people are suffering. Or in other words, what you're suffering is not your bondage, as people are telling you, what you're suffering is your freedom. Because nature has left you free, you can be any way you want right now. See, if you… if you were born as a tiger, you wouldn't have this confusion, you know? You wouldn't sit and worry, will I become a good tiger or not <laughs> If you eat enough food, you will become a good tiger. There is no confusion, will I end up as a pussycat, will I become a great tiger? There's no such problems for a tiger. There is no such problem for any other creature because for all of them two lines are fixed. You eat well, you will become that. But you eat well, this will not become that <laughs> This one has come without a top line, so you… it is left to you to determine what this should become. When such a freedom life has offered to us, This is the greatest possibility. Upon this planet at least, of the life that we have seen, this is the greatest possibility, isn't it? Instead of exploring it, we're trying to fix it all the time. This is this, this is that. We are trying to fix a top line. But tell me, whatever you are right now, would you like to be something more? You must tell me right now, otherwise I'll bless you. If that something more happens, what? More. You want something more? If that happens, what? Yes. More. So, you seem to be wanting to expand in installment slowly. So, let's say I will make you the king or queen of this planet. Don't look at me hopefully <laughs> Does it look like I'm going to commit such a blunder today? No. <laughs> Suppose you become the king or queen of this planet, Will you be fulfilled? I'm asking you. No. You will look at the stars, isn't it? <coughs> yes or no? Yes. This is the nature of the human being because you are not looking for more, you're looking for all. <laughs> and all cannot happen physically. If you're looking for all, this means you're looking for a boundless goal, an infinite goal. You're looking at infinity and going in installments, this is a terrible crippling process. Yes, you're looking at the infinite, your goal is infinite nature, but your approach is installments. Can you count one, two, three, four, five quickly and arrive at infinity one day? No. You will only become endless counting, isn't it? So if you're longing for something infinite, this means you're longing for something without boundaries. Your longing for without something without boundaries means you cannot approach it with a dimension with boundaries. When I say dimension with boundaries, see, everything physical, physical is possible only if there is a defined boundary, isn't it? Now, this we call a physical body because it has a defined boundary. If we pull out all the boundaries, then this is no more physical, isn't it? Physicality is a consequence of boundaries, but there is something within you longing to become boundless. 
If this longing to become boundless, if you give it an unconscious expression, if it finds a very basic physical expression, we call this sexuality. All you are trying to do is, something that is not you, you are trying to make it a part of yourself. It seems to work for a moment and after that it doesn't. If you find an emotional expression for this, we call this love. This again the same thing, something that is not you, you are trying to make it a part of yourself. If it finds a mental expression, it gets labeled as greed, ambition, conquest or simply shopping. If it finds a conscious expression, generally we used to call it yoga, but in New York City, I'm a little afraid to use that word because immediately all of you may start <laughs> what people are doing in the Times Square, you may start, start doing it right here, it's just next door. No, yoga does not mean twisting and turning your body. Yoga means you learned how to obliterate the boundaries of your individuality. You learned how to erase. Why should I erase? Not that you should erase, because there is no boundary, it is only your psychological structure which is giving you a boundary. Right now when you sit here, you are absolute, isn't it? This is me, that's you, hundred percent. But try this and see, close your mouth, hold your nose like this for a minute. You will know that this is not absolute, this has to transact continuously, isn't it? What you exhale, the trees are inhaling, what the trees exhale, you are inhaling. If you stop this transaction or in other words, for those of you who are pulmonologists, one half of your lungs is actually hanging out there on the tree, isn't it? <laughs> yes or no? One half of your lungs is out there because this cannot function without that. Now, this is not just on the respiratory level, every subatomic particle in this body is in constant transaction with everything in this cosmos, otherwise this cannot exist for a moment. See, here we are, sitting on a round planet and the damn thing is spinning on top of it. And in the middle of nowhere, you don't know where it begins, where it ends, here we are sitting and doing all this talking. Obviously, a million forces that you don't even understand are keeping you in place, isn't it? Yes or no? If you don't know, you go up a mountain or dive into the water, you will understand what I am saying. If you go up a mountain, your brains will fill up with water. If you go down, your blood and brain will become full of air. All that's happened is little change in pressure. So the whole lot of forces, even managing and keeping you in place and in one piece, isn't it? If all the pressure is taken out, we may become bits and pieces. Too much pressure, we may become something else. Not just pressure, on a million different ways. This is right now being supported by too many things. You're on life support, I'm saying <laughs> constantly. Otherwise, this cannot last by itself. So, anyway, there is no boundary for this life to exist. The life within knows this. Even the body knows this. Only your mind doesn't know this. Your mind thinks you're an absolute creature by yourself. So when you consciously erase this boundary in your mind, this means you can sit here and experience everything as yourself. If everything in the universe you begin to experience as myself, then we say you're in yoga or we say you're a yogi. This means a union has happened. You have successfully erased. What is the use of this? This means there are different dimensions of intelligence within us. Unfortunately, our education systems are using only one aspect of it, which is called the intellect. In yoga, we identify sixteen dimensions to human mind. These sixteen dimensions are seen as four parts. We will look at these four parts. This is called as buddhi, ahankara, manas and chitta. Buddhi means intellect. Intellect must be sharp, otherwise it won't work. But it is the sharpness of the intellect which is cutting you up every day. <laughs> Not because intellect is a bad thing, if you don't have a steady hand, a sharp knife is a problem, isn't it? Why we don't give a knife 
to a child's hand is not because the knife is dangerous, because a child doesn't have a steady hand. In the last twenty-four hours, what do you think? Have knives saved more lives or taken more lives? <laughs> Surgeons, please tell me <laughs> So she's saying because we are all here, they are all saved <laughs> It has saved many lives in a few irresponsible hands, it might have taken some lives, but knife is not dangerous, sharper it is, the better it is. Hello? Yes. yes. So intellect is not the problem, sharper it is, the better it is. An unsteady platform, then it starts cutting you up, it either cuts other people or cuts you up. The next dimension of the intelligence is called ahankara. Ahankara does not mean ego as most people think, it is the identity. Because the nature of the identity, the subtlety of the identity determines how your intellect functions. Right now I say, I am a man. The stronger I say it, the more my intellect will try to protect my masculine nature. If you say I am a woman, it will start protecting that. If I say I am an Indian, it will start protecting that. If I say an American, it protects that. To what extent? Even to the extent, even if it costs my life, it's okay. But my Indianness or my Americanness or my manliness must be protected at any cost. This is what ahankara does to you because the identity, how you take the identity. There is an entire system of education in India which is about training a child how he should groom his ahankara his identification, how he should groom it in such a way that it is beneficial for him and beneficial for everybody around him. How to groom one's identification, there's a whole process. Unfortunately, we've given up everything, we get stuck to something or the other. So identity is the hand which holds the knife of the intellect. How steady it is, how subtle it is will determine what the knife will do. Now, this is rooted in what is referred to as manas, manas means it's a huge silo of memory. Memory, we recognize memory as eight different dimensions of memory, starting from evolutionary memory, genetic memory, unconscious memory, conscious memory and many other aspects of it, eight different dimensions of memory. When I say all these different types of memory, I'm sure you don't remember how your great-great-great-great-grandfather or grandmother look like, yes? You don't remember that, but their noses are sitting on your face right now. <laughs> yes or no? Your body remembers one hundred percent. Yes or no? It even remembers the skin tone of your great-grandmother. You might not have seen her, you may not remember, but it remembers everything. So the amount of memory that every cell in the body carries is a trillion times more than what your mind can ever carry. We are thinking intellect is everything and thought processes become everything because this is… this is a European mess-up that happened to the entire world. Somebody said, I think so I am. Tch, no, because you are, you may think. Yes or no? <laughs> Which is first I'm asking you, because you are, you may think, because you become a… such a mental diarrhea that all the time thought is flowing, you think thought is even before you? Not because you think you are, because you are, you may think. Like if I want, I move my hand where I want, I should be able to move my mind where I want. When I don't want, I must be able to hold it here, isn't it? Right now the problem is, it's become like this all the time. If this happened to your body, you would look ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> Even with the mind, it is the same thing, your only comfort is others cannot see it. Yes? It's equally ridiculous. You are… you are comfortable because you think the person next to you cannot see it, but if they pay enough attention, they can. They can't, believe me <laughs> Now. The manas is a silo of memory. If you cut off the connection between the memory and the intellect, your intellect feels suddenly useless if it is not empowered by memory. 
see people lose their memory, their intellect is still intact, but it's no use because there is no memory. So these are what three dimensions and the fourth dimension is called as chitta. Chitta is a dimension of intelligence within you, unsullied by memory. There is no iota of memory in this. What memory means is, memory is the way you are setting up your boundaries. With memory you recognize, this is my friend, oh I don't know who this is, that is my relative, I don't know who that is. You're establishing the boundaries of your life with your memory. Everything that you remember sets a boundary for you, isn't it? You remember this is my country, now it sets a boundary for you. You remember this is my father, it sets a boundary for you. You remember this is my husband, sets a boundary for you. This is my child, sets a boundary for you. There is a dimension of intelligence within you which is unsullied by memory. If you touch your chitta, in the yogic lore, in a very mischievous way, it is said, if you touch your chitta, God becomes your slave. Because the dimension of intelligence which is capable of making a banana into a human being, if it became a conscious process, you would definitely live magically, isn't it? Other people will think you are superhuman, but I am telling you, this is what it means to be human. To eat, sleep, reproduce and die, you don't have to come with such a complex mechanism. An earthworm, if peace is the highest goal, you must come as an earthworm and it's very eco-friendly <laughs> All its aspirations are hundred percent ecologically sensitive, isn't it? Yes or no? If you… if you have a question, please. Yes, please. Namaskaram, Sadhguru. I have a question about medicine and law. In my opinion, a lot of uh, physicians make medical decisions with fear of the legal system and malpractice suits. This fear affects the physician-patient relationship and increases healthcare costs. For example, I know I've ordered some tests for patients based on this fear, and I've seen other physicians do the same. So can you please speak on physicians' legal responsibility in taking care of someone else's health? And what can physicians as individuals and as a social collective do to overcome this fear? In ancient India, it was always said, there are three things which should never be commercialized – education, health and spiritual process. The moment you commercialize these three things, they will take the society in a completely different direction. When I say completely in a different direction, people are telling me, I'm, I have no way to check the statistics, they're telling me the food industry on the planet is 7.6 trillion dollars. The pharmaceutical industry is 7.2 trillion dollars. By the end of 2017, they're saying the pharmaceutical industry will be well above the food industry. This doesn't look like we are creating health on the planet, right? We are eating more medicine than food, doesn't mean that we are doing great, obviously. So somewhere we've gone little off the rails and I'm sure I know what I say is not going to be very popular here. All of you have taken up a certain oath, isn't it? So your commitment is to health. Your commitment is not to legal systems. Your commitment is to health and life of the person who sits in front of you at that moment or usually they lie in front of you probably. Your commitment is to that life and the well-being of that life. If legal systems are such right now, people are exploiting it, in many different ways for their own advantages. Let it be so, one or two will suffer, I know. But suppose all of you practice medicine as it should be for the well-being of the patient, I'm sure most of the time that's your concern. But sometimes legal systems, other things take over. If you ignore those things and do it, suppose half of you have liability look, uh, cases against you, then they have to change the law. 
Right now only one or two percent are under the liability, so they won't change the law. I'm saying, you must become a majority, then the law will change, obviously. But medical systems, healthcare, your education and the capability to meddle with somebody's life, all this was given to you with a trust that you will always keep the well-being of that person above everything else. Let's keep it that way, please.